podcasts. The woman we're profiling this week used to be a bit of a rocker. I wanted to play a song that I used to play to them probably too loudly in the car when the three of us were together. Status quo her thing, she told Radio 4's Desert Island Dis a couple of years back. And then you get the amazing status quo guitars and it's a, it's a great song, it'll get me on my feet. That's 73-year-old retired appeal court judge and cross-bench life peer, Baroness Heather Hallett, a judicial trailblazer who smashed, banged her head through several glass ceilings over the years. The first female chair of the Bar Council, an appeal court judge. And now, having hung up her wig in 2019, finds herself centre stage again, heading the independent inquiry into the government's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic, which begins in earnest this coming week. Hallett caught up in an extraordinary row even before it's begun. The government, which appointed her, taking legal action to try to stop her seeing some messages exchanged by former Prime Minister Boris Johnson and his team despite Johnson already having handed them over. The irony not lost on Baroness Hallett during a preliminary hearing earlier this week. Even though Mr Johnson himself says he would reveal them to the inquiry without reduction, the Cabinet Office is going to apply reductions to somebody else's material. Um, Have my, I got that right? My lady, the, 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 the position is that the Cabinet Office is working out its position uh, and it will keep the inquiry informed. As you might imagine, there was a roll of the eyes at this point, the Baroness's brow firmly furrowed. She is a very solid lump of lead inside a velvet glove. She's tough. My view is she's absolutely right. This is a genuine battle and the political repercussions of this are enormous. Unlike some former pillars of the English judiciary, Heather Carroll Hallett wasn't born with a silver spoon in her mouth. Her story starts at the end of 1949, the youngest of two children, raised in Eastleigh in Hampshire in a terraced house which backed onto a rail yard. Her mum Doris, a secretary, typist and Sound of Music fan, constantly complaining about the soot from the engines. Dad Hugh was a beat bobby, TV's Dixon of Doc Green all the rage back then, though he was more Hallett of Hampshire. Observer newspaper political editor Toby Helm. She is the daughter of a policeman. It wasn't a sort of highly privileged background. She also is very much a self-made person. You can't say that about most judges who tend to be privately educated and from very well-off backgrounds. By contrast, Heather Hallett went to state schools. Nine different ones, she says, over the course of her childhood. The family upping sticks every time her father got promoted to a new police station, which was often a family even living in a police station at one point. So you came in the front door. On your right was the police reception. On your left was our sitting room. And to the right was the door to the cells. And, and my mother, because the police service expected the woman to do whatever the job demanded, uh, she had to serve the prisoners their meals. Spam fritters and chips, a 1950s British culinary classic. When her father reached the rank of assistant chief constable, her move to another county, Kent, was on the cards. But Heather stayed put in Hampshire, went into digs and continued her schooling there. Her teachers telling her she wasn't good enough for university and should aspire at best to becoming a domestic science teacher. She ignored them, applied to Oxford to study law and in 1968 won a place at St Hugh's College. Close friend Dave Hazel Gen, now Professor of Socio-Legal Studies at University College London. It was tough to get in, very tough to get into Oxbridge and very tough for women to get in at that time. And I think she was very proud of that. At a lecture one day, she found herself sat next to fellow student Nigel Wilkinson. She thought he was handsome, he liked her hot pants, but told her he didn't want a long-term relationship. Men, eh? By the mid-1970s, they were married and now have two grown-up children. She was called to the bar shortly after graduating from Oxford and focused on criminal law, representing or prosecuting people accused of armed robbery, rape and even serial killings, at one point successfully defending a stepfather wrongly accused of murder in an early cop death trial. In a very male-orientated world, she hugely impressed the entire establishment. 
she's got a stellar record in the law and a stellar reputation. By 1989, she'd been made a QC. Six years later, she was leader of the South Eastern Circuit, the body that represents the interests of barristers in that part of England. Then, in 1998, made history as the first woman to chair the Bar Council. Barrister Neil Saunders has known her for the best part of 40 years. To lead in the way she did the circuit, the, the bar, I mean, she was one of the forefront figures at the time. You know, there were very few women who were so preeminent in the work they were doing. Though she often encountered discrimination when applying for jobs, she told a friend, Hazel Gen. At that time, the judiciary absolutely dominated by men. One of the ma- men interviewing complained about the fact that she had all these bangles on and far too much jewellery. It didn't stop there. When she was promoted, Hallett found herself propositioned by a judge claiming he had been responsible for her getting the job. And he made it perfectly plain how I could thank him, physically, sexually. On another occasion, in the middle of a trial, she was summoned to see the judge in his room on her own. He said, you have one sprog so far, but it's obviously time you had another. If you need somebody helping to, and he used the F word, then I'm your man. Sleaze ball. Baroness Butler Sloss, the first ever female Lord Justice of Appeal, began her legal career two decades earlier. Faced occasional discrimination, but not to the extent Hallett did. Family connections helping her, she says. I think I was a bit protected because I was the daughter of a judge and the sister of a eventually Attorney General, Michael Havers. So I think I was a bit protected on sort of sexism. Hallett came from an entirely different class and wasn't related to Nigel Havers. She does come from a different kind of background, a different kind of education from some of the people that she would have been dealing with. Former Lord Chancellor, Lord Faulkner. She's very pro-diversity, but gender diversity and racial diversity. She is on a different planet. She is a, a very, very modern judge who has all the authority of the more established judges, but really connects with the times. Ring of a change, making waves. Could be time for another three-chord quo classic. Yes, don't stop me now. By 1999, still in her 40s, Heather Hallett became a full-time High Court judge, a High Flyer, an Alan Lancaster composition for those of you taking notes. Baroness Butler Sloss, then the UK's highest ranking female judge, impressed by her. She's very good at what she does. She's efficient, she has excellent judgment, she knows how to hold a court. She was promoted to the Court of Appeal, then only the fifth woman to sit in the court. The inquests have heard from more than 500 witnesses. There have been stories of incredible bravery as passengers and rescuers tried to help the injured and the dying. She also acted as coroner at the inquest into the 52 people killed during four bomb attacks on the London Transport Network in July 2005, where, current Cabinet Office take note, she took on the security services over the evidence they were willing to share with her. The big issue with the intelligence services as to whether or not they should give the information they had got about the bombers before the bombs went off. They resisted giving that information and she insisted that they give that information. They took her to court and the courts fully backed her in her demand for information. Neil Saunders represented the families of 10 of the victims, all of them struck, he says, by her empathetic approach to the hearings. She was marvellous. I remember one of the mothers whose daughter had died on the Tavistock Square bombing on the bus was getting upset and... Lady Justice Hallett said to me, Mr Saunders, would you like to have a few minutes with her? So I had a few minutes in court. We were all still sitting and said, you know, the the coroner's prepared to rise if you want to. And said, no, 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 thank you very much for that. I just want to get on and find out what were the last words that were said by or to my daughter. Despite the often harrowing stories told, she kept her own emotions in check, though she later told Desert Island Discs she had needed help to stop herself from crying at times. It was a trick taught to me by a judge who was also ordained. You stick your nails into the palms of your hand and cause pain. And if you cause pain, that emotion helps prevent... I'm doing it now. 
as I speak, it helps prevent the emotion of tears. And on one occasion, I came out of a 7-7 hearing and my palm was bleeding. There were other high-profile cases. Lady Justice Alice quashing a murder conviction against a young man wrongly jailed for killing a chef, one of the youngest ever victims of a miscarriage of justice. By 2013, she'd made it onto the Radio 4 Woman's Hour inaugural Top 100 Power List, many tipping her to become the next Lord Chief Justice. For the first time in a thousand years, a woman was Lord Chancellor. Unfortunately for Lady Hallett, that woman was Liz Truss, who ruled anyone applying for the Lord Chief Justice role had to be at least five years away from the judge's compulsory retirement age of 70. Lord Faulkner again. I think she was 65 or 66 at the time. I don't know who Liz Truss was trying to stop applying, but it stopped her applying. She's taken some knocks and she's taken them pretty well. A friend, Professor Hazel Gen. I want to be careful what I say about this here, but I think she was pretty devastated by it. She retired as a judge in October 2019, shortly before her 70th birthday, and was given a life peerage. More time on her hands, perhaps, for her hobbies. At her retirement due, she came out as a Strictly fan. Struth has confessed to being an iPad games addict, playing everything from Candy Crush to Killer Sudoku. Likes to sun herself, too. My goodness, she loves travelling. I think her favourite place is actually on a Caribbean island with Nigel, looking out over the sea. She loves warm weather. She loves boating, speed boating. I think she broke her back. And she was thrown off a speedboat and she literally broke her back. And if you think she moaned about it, she didn't. After retirement, the high-profile gigs continued to come her way. A murder inquiry is launched after a woman in Wiltshire exposed to the nerve agent Novichok dies. The Prime Minister... In 2021, she was asked to take over as coroner in the inquest into Dawn Sturgis, the Wiltshire woman who died from Novichok poisoning. Then, a few months later, Boris Johnson came knocking, choosing her to lead the inquiry into his government's handling of Covid. She's not hung about. The terms of the inquiry agreed and signed off last year. She demanded to see Boris Johnson's diaries, his and his team's phone messages, all of it unredacted. Journalist Toby Helm. She's also pummeled him with questions which sort of go straight to the point. There's no pussyfooting about here. The Cabinet Office resisted, claimed some of the material was private or irrelevant to the inquiry, then launched legal action, questioning whether she has the authority to demand it. Toby Helm thinks her approach so far has clearly rattled some in government. They don't want a precedent to be set, which allows Lady Hallett to say, well, we got all Boris Johnson's stuff, so now we have a right to everybody else's stuff. Anyone who's ever watched TV's Yes Minister will know Prime Ministers and their mandarins tend to choose people to lead inquiries who they know will give them the answer they want. With Baroness Hallett, Observer political editor Toby Helm isn't entirely convinced they've done their homework properly. Was it a bit of a quick decision, you might say, to appoint Lady Hallett without having sort of checked her out a bit more because it could come back to haunt them? Lord Faulkner. Heather Hallett is the person. She is an extremely good choice to be the chair of the inquiry. She is an extremely bad choice as chair for a government that wants to hold back material that's relevant. I'm John Sudworth, and this is the story of my quest to ask a question. No interview, horrendous. You, you have no right to tell me not to ask questions. It's one that's become embroiled in the fractious and fevered politics of our times. It's very dangerous to stir up suspicion, rumours. It's not racist at all, no, not at all. It comes from China. 